Welcome to the Painting Like Picasso video. The first step was to go to the library, and I know a lot of people kind of take libraries for granted now, but really, libraries are still a great place to find high quality prints of paintings. If you don't have access to a real copy or uh, access to a real Picasso, the best place to find the best reproduction of that image is not on the internet. It's probably in a book. So don't forget about going to the library. I found this book called Picasso's Cubist Years. And this is just all about cubism because with Picasso, we have a situation where an artist is known for a variety of different styles that he was using over the years. And he truly is an epic character. So as always, these videos are just about me trying out a style, having you watch along, and maybe we can both learn something together. I never start these videos saying, I am the great at mimicking Picasso. These videos are about me attempting this style and starting to look at things and trying my best to, to emulate them. And hopefully through that, you can also learn these techniques and create your own paintings that are based um, off the similar techniques. So, <clears throat> This book is a great book. It's got a lot of, it's called Picasso Cubist Years. So it's focusing just on Picasso's Cubist period. And as you can see, it starts off by looking at a lot of these masks and how Picasso's faces were starting to get pulled into different areas. So this would be around 1907 when he did uh, Demoiselle d'Avignon, the women of d'Avignon. And of course this was considered a, a big controversial piece because these women looked like beasts. They were prostitutes and they had these African-like masks on that they were wearing as well. But we can already see some elements of cubism start to come into these images here. So we can see how the face is starting to warp around in space. So we forget that before Picasso was doing, during his blue period, he was painting kind of naturalistically and figuratively. He was an expert draftsman, so there was no problem with drawing the figure. And this departure began, and part of that involved seeing, and looking at objects and seeing multiple perspectives on that object. So one thing we often see in Picasso's, of course, is the front of the face, which can also be the side of the face. So, from here, now we can get into these drawings. That's where I wanted to look next. So, in these drawings, we can see that a lot of it's based on these lines, hard lines, and then shading on the outsides of these. And a lot of this is just about pushing and pulling the picture plane. So pushing things forward, like this T, looks like it's in front of something. This head, we can see that little overlap there. That shows that the head is behind there. And we're pushing and pulling space. And a lot of abstract painting is simply about pushing and pulling space. The same way if you look at a landscape, you can see that elements of the landscape are in the background. They're pushed into the background. Other elements come forward into the foreground. So we can look at these basics and also think about simply pushing and pulling space and what it means to push and pull space. In this still life here, which was a common theme for a lot of Picasso's cubist works, we can see that a lot of naturalistic tones are still occurring in this piece here. However, there's simple overlap here, 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 even this little red thing poking out behind it, we can read this as an abstract image if we cover it up. And just imagine that that image exists. And that could be an abstract painting right there. So again, this red is pulling forward in space. This 
dark is going back in space and having this bright red here creates that tension between these two elements. There's a lot of different still lifes. It's a really common exploration for a lot of these paintings. One thing to remember about Picasso, he's quite traditional in the fact that he's doing very traditional themes, landscapes, figures, still lifes. He wasn't really an abstract painter. He didn't really like abstraction. So here we can see looking at a landscape and now we're starting to get into this grid. Of course, very influential in these, this is 1909 now, very influential in these would be Picasso's friend George Brock, who was the real pioneer of this movement, but Picasso grabbed hold of it so strongly that he obviously became a very influential force on the creation of it as well. So here in these figures we can start to see that the face is being broken up into these individual planes. And this part of the face actually looks like there could be another nose here and that could be a different view of the face completely. So we're seeing like a three-quarter view here and a frontal view here. So we're combining those two different views into one image. Again, breaking things down into simple shapes, this kind of grid-like drawing element is still there even back to when we looked at it here, wherever that was, here, this stuff, you know, dark grids, same thing is happening here on both of these. So we're looking for these dark areas and slowly blending out of those. This green is another good indicator there. And here we can see that the, the still lifes are really starting to become if we got rid of this thing, which kind of indicates some sort of form here, if we got rid of that, this would appear almost just as a completely abstract work. But uh, always Picasso was clinging to some sort of narrative and representation. So here we see this, I don't know what it looks like, some sort of a, almost like a can of hairspray, but who knows what it was, it was some still life, but here we have all these planes broken into smaller and smaller pieces. This almost looks like futurism to me. If you know that one futuristic painting of the person walking with the dog, this kind of reminds me of those legs of that person. Here we have a, a just a really nice little still life, and this is a good indication of just how simply these forms can be broke down into different shapes. Different perspectives. Obviously this saucer should be a, an ellipse, but he's looking at it in different perspectives and putting these things together in different perspectives. Coming into the portraits, more disintegrations with these triangles. A lot of triangles, and it's, and it's not a mistake that we're seeing a lot of triangles in these. If, if we look at 3D software today, they're often still making work that is simply about making little triangles intersect with other little triangles. There's a lot of different artwork that uses this today. So these shapes kind of interlock and they can create form. This one almost looks like it's floating here. It's kind of cartoon head. But again, if we take the face out, becomes completely abstract. Another thing we're note, we can see in these is that there tends to be a concentration on the center of the canvas. There's a lot more going on here and it kind of dissipates towards the edges. So I think that's an important thing to, to consider when making a copy of one of these. Make it denser and denser in the middle and then slowly make it less dense as we go to the outside. Here we can see the same thing occurring. Denser and denser here more open on the sides. And this is in um, conjunction with how we look at portraiture in general. We'll see a lot of um, more happening in the middle, less going on in the outside. More detail here if we look at John Singer Sargent or whoever. Here um, 
Picasso was experimenting with collage for a while as well. And a lot of these were done with a palette knife. And these are definitely brush marks. When you start looking at these, these are definite brush marks. And again, he's using this kind of grid-like construction to create the space. The colors of this are really reminiscent of almost like an alleyway. It reminds me of a New York alleyway or something like that. With this one little goblet here clinging on to that still life and representational painting. But an extremely limited palette. You know, we've got a little bit of this purplish blue, some burnt umber looking color, looks like phthalo blue probably, or ultramarine blue, mixed with a little bit of that umber, and a very, very loose and fluid canvas here. This one's worked a little bit more, a little more paint, a little bit more oil, more blending. Have this candle right here table here, some little grapes down here, but again, concentrated in the middle, and less so on the edges. So I think this gives us a good idea of, of what we can look for and how we can start the painting. So I'm going to set up a still life, and we'll get into the second part of this, which is going to try to make our own version. So I've set up a simple still life here with some stuff I have in my studio, some sunglasses, my wallet, can of spray paint. And this is the still life I'm going to use as observation, and this is basically just a blasting off point. Of course, Picasso would have cared about the images that he was in including. I don't think he was just randomly looking at a table as somebody who was so interested in metaphor and symbology, he probably picked out items that were, were very important. So, in this case, mine are a little bit more of a hodgepodge of items, but if you want to make a more authentic copy of a Picasso Cubist piece, I would suggest really thinking about those items that you're including in your still life and, and using as a blasting off point. All these things are kind of important to me, but they might not represent my portrait, so to speak. And a lot of people talk about how still lifes are actually a lot like portraiture because these objects tell us a lot about the person um, that possesses them. So, got this all set up, and I'm going to go straight into the painting now. So I've got my palette all set up. I'm just going to be working with a series of flats in order to do this. I don't know why these are so wet. But just simple flat brush, synthetic, springy, and I got a big one. And then I got a middle sized one. And this is pretty much what I'm going to work with. You can do quite a bit with this. Now I'm going to get my book and make sure I have that opened to a page for reference. I can't stress this enough. I often have students, they do this assignment and they get to choose their artist at the end of the semester as a final, final project. And, and so often, they just kind of think they remember everything in their head. They're like, oh, this artist does this and this. No, he doesn't. So find, find an image that's similar to the one you're trying to emulate in your book. Okay? Let's look here. Um, do I want to do late cubism or early cubism? That's the question. Ooh, those are nice. So I've identified which image. So I've identified which image I'm going to be using as a reference. It's this one 
right here. Wait, no, it's not this one. It's on this page. Yeah, it's this one here, and I just really like the color harmonies going on here. These warm oranges down here, and these very, very cool grays. A little bit of a hint of rose in there. Even a little text. I don't know if I want to go there. Um, but believe it or not, this one is called Pigeon with Green Peas. I checked it multiple times. I'm imagining these are not grapes as I had previously thought. These are peas. And the pigeon, I don't know. I don't know where the pigeon is. I see this candle here. But checked it multiple times. Right here it says Pigeon with Green Peas, 1912. So, that's pretty weird. Um, yeah, so wherever the pigeon is, as you can see, sometimes these things get so far abstracted that we don't even recognize what's there anymore. So I'm gonna really just be looking at the structure while I'm painting. I'm gonna keep this page open to look at and reference throughout this process. So let's get into it. Put this down here in my handy little holder which is a tub of gesso. There we go. So the first thing I'm gonna start out with is these black lines that we were talking about. And for that, I'm just literally gonna use black. And I think this will be a good way to start Get that down to a nice consistency, not too wet, but enough to draw with. And I'm just going to start in, I'm still looking, and I'm going to try to sketch these items first, just to use as something which can be abstracted later. This also is a good practice when you're looking at it to help you think about what it is that you're painting and really get into what is actually there before you abstract it. So just looking at simple shapes here. And already we've got quite a bit going on. I'm going to already start referencing to see how he would handle this. Now this thing in real life is going like this and then coming down like that on a table. But I don't think that's the type of space Picasso would, would necessarily employ. I think a lot of times these are going to be more square. Start thinking about the space being abstracted into these grids. One really simple way to get a real feel of everything that exists there already, I'm going to get a little bit more paint thinner in here to make drawing a bit easier, is to take all your existing edges and extend them out. Now we can really start seeing about how, how these things exist in space. How far into space do they go? Remember, don't be afraid to just get abstract with it. Painting on a piece of masonite here, pretty simple, medium. Now one thing I'm noticing about a lot of these two is they have this strong center thing. So I'm just gonna establish that center line. I know this is off a little bit to the side, but I didn't want it to be right here. Let's start playing with that center line, establishing how that works in space.
right angles like this always talk about the picture plane. So they're referencing these edges. Again, don't think about copying, think about making up a new language to see this space. I'm gonna go for my first turn here and act like this is something and this is flat. So that spray can is just becoming flat and let's go really extreme. Too worried yet. The whole painting can just be loose. I want to try to get that density, building up this density up here. More dense in the center, more stuff going on. space really work? Can you flatten an area in that space completely? I'm just going to make a little candle because if my reference was a pigeon in peas, then certainly there can be a candle. I'm going to put in some organic elements in it. matrix down into different pieces. Playing with that picture plane. I think that's getting good for a basic sketch and from here I think we can really move on to some sort of color. Just kind of looking at what's behind this still life. Keeping some big elements out here. So we can start feeling that these are bigger shapes and in here it's denser. These can all be altered further. All right, well, I think that gets a good basic skeleton of something to work with. I think there needs to be a little bit more density going on here, more stuff going on here just to kind of balance things out. Then I'm backing up on it a little bit more.
And a lot of these extra elements I think we can add as we get on to the next stage, which will be color. So let's start getting into the color. If we remember our book, remember our book. There's our image we're looking at. So I'm gonna focus on these cool tones, like I said before, these cool grays and these warm oranges. That's a lot of what's happening in these pa this painting. A lot of hard edged line and some kind of gradient line here. So we're gonna start getting into the color and we can look back to our source image here. And we can see that there's a lot of oranges here that are talking nicely with these whites. And <clears throat> there's these very cool grays and blues here. So I'm using ultramarine blue for these. And we can also see that there's a lot of hard edged line work. And there's kind of these scumbled edges. And there's also these gradients. So we're going to be looking at all those different elements. <clears throat> so in the palette, we've got the working man's palette, of course, cadmium red medium, cadmium yellow medium, and here is ultramarine blue. Instead of phthalo blue, I'm using ultramarine <clears throat> because I imagine that Picasso would have most likely been using ultramarine blue, and you know, come on, it's French. So here we got titanium white. <coughs> so we've got the working man's palette here set up. Cad red medium, cad yellow medium, ultramarine, French ultramarine blue, and titanium white. Here's a little burnt umber, and we can get into that as well. But mainly we're gonna be using these four colors kind of ignore. This is called ruby red, pyrrol ruby red, and this is a violet down here. Here's some burnt sienna <clears throat> and black. I do tend to like using black in this piece, especially. So as we can see on the palette here, I've mixed up some burnt umber, add a little bit of white to it, some black, and then I started playing around with these orange tones that were also pre pre present in my, my reference imagery as well. And I kind of jumped in to the beginning of this painting and started filling in some different areas, as you can see here, with the orange and using some subtle variants on that gray and just playing with these cool tones against these warm tones. So let's continue on with this. And we're really just playing with these colors. I think it's kind of important to have a lot of these colors out when, when you're painting, but if you're not sure how to start, just get a little bit of white on this. This is just that same flat brush. Really cheap brush. I even got some duct tape holding it together here. And just by tapping in these areas, you're making all these different triangles. And you can really just play with having the end of your paintbrush with a little bit of this paint. And you can lighten it up quite quickly or darken it. And a lot of this painting is going to be that kind of messy painting. Because one of the big things I think present in a lot of these reference images that I'm looking at is there's a very limited palette. There's a, definitely an urge to make some bright blues and some reds and things that really stick out. But a lot of the paintings from this time period are really much more subdued than that. So we're just going to kind of 
make our palette and create these different warm areas and cool areas and pop in between all of them as we, as we go. Just filling in these little circles, creating some space. We can start to see how the space is moving just based on simple overlap. So let me show you something here. These images all seem to be coming to about the same place in space. Just by simply overlapping them with another shape, immediately that space is changed. Keeping the palette really messy. I'm not even cleaning my brush at all. Get some more of these orange tones throughout. A lot of times these colors might look a little bit too dead. But a lot of the colors back then would have been a little bit more subdued than what we're used to today with looking at our screens all day in these bright colors. Back in those days, the color of wood would have been more prevalent in the home. Leather that brown leather color. Let me imagine those old pipes, like a pipe stem or something like that. So the color palette from these is kind of from another era. I'm gonna take a little bit of black and I'm really gonna establish where I want these hard lines. And now I'm starting to use a little bit more paint as well, instead of being so smooth with all my paint. Remember these things are denser in the middle, and they kind of ease up as they move out. Just kind of establishing these areas a little bit more. I'm still looking at that still life that I've created over here. I'm still referencing that from time to time just to see where these images originally are and how they occupy that space. So that original still life sitting over there, I am glancing at that from time to time just to get a better idea of where these things are. Let's see how straight on I can go. It's tough. And over here, as you can see, I actually have a close-up. I took some scans of the book and on my monitor over here I've got Photoshop open with some details of the scans. So you can scan these books at, you know, 300 dpi and get a pretty good detail image by doing that. So that'll help you establish your techniques as well. And a lot of this is going to be kind of the fun time now, just playing with these shapes. I think we can even afford to go into a bigger brush. Grab a little bit larger brush. Load it up with more white. A little bit too wet. I'm 
let's start establishing some big shapes on the outside too, just to start to see how these things talk to each other. One thing I'm trying to keep loose because these paintings you don't want them to get too nice. One thing that Picasso was he was not necessarily a nice painter in terms I mean he could paint nicely if he wanted to but he was also trying to get rid of that refined look to his painting. He wanted them to look crude and primitive. So we're gonna block in some more of these big areas. Here we get a really, I'm going to try a really rough gradation here. It's by steadily adding more and more white as I go. Now that I'm using more paint, I can really kind of start to feel these things come to life in a different way. Ooh, so tempting to use that pink, but just not there. there would have been other square painters at the time, Mondrian, these type of people just making these kind of simple square paintings. So I'm sure those people were individuals Picasso was aware of. said God bless you. All right. And you can really see I'm just 
starting to fill in these areas. Just using that original pattern that we started with. <clears throat> colors can change a little bit more as we proceed. We're going to go back in with a lot of black. Strengthen these edges up. Make some more. Gradients here and there. to look really chaotic. I don't think you want it to be too grounded in reality at this stage. I'm going to see what happens. I'll just use a smidgen because there is some blue. Wow, look at that blue amongst all these grays. Just a hint of that ultramarine blue and that's just really activating everything nicely now. Just a little bit. Keeping everything toned down like I said. But that little bit of blue sure is nice. Really makes all those oranges start talking to each other. You know, you can feel how warm this is and how cool this is. How nice that feels up against each other. It's warm and cool colors. Just can't resist that blue. These two circles are kind of talking to each other now in space too, giving an indication of that table. There's a couple of these pink areas, but not many. Just a little bit of pink. That's all. You want to do it everywhere, I know. But part of the game is knowing when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. So you got to know when to hold back. Just those little, those three little pieces of red. That's enough. Now you're probably wondering like, what, are you just going to keep filling this in? Yes. And I've got this armature here. I'm 
really excited for the next part. We've got a pretty fun mess here. And what I'm going to do is grab this brown, get a big pile of that, and just mix that black with it. And we're going to start going over these lines again. paint all over the whole thing we can tighten it up a bit to be afraid to get the dark areas dark. and pulling. Everything's flat now. Let's start getting some stuff in front of stuff. Pull that space back into different spray paint can.
these lines are just too thick. Like these are just too thick. Pushing and pulling the space, pushing and pulling the space. I'm just going to look at this again. There's that side of that wallet. So I hope this could have give you a good indication of how to make a cubist painting. I think we did a, a valiant attempt. Again, I'd like to re reiterate. I do these videos for fun, just to try to figure stuff out a lot of times while I'm painting. And hopefully by looking, help you out too by watching these techniques. But more important than watching, of course, is always doing. So try to make your own. I think when you get to this point, a lot of it has to do with just pulling back. Like I said, I wish I had one day to let it dry and then come in with some of these scumbling lights and to get a little bit more of those light colors in there. But I think this makes sense. So if you're interested in more of these sort of things, check out the painting like videos. I got four of them now so far. Painting like Van Gogh, painting like Monet, a copy of Velasquez, and 
Now I've got the Picasso Cubism one. So if you're into these type of videos or want to actually take an online course that's actually free, then hop on over to paintingcourse.com. I'm your host. There I am. How's it going? Um, so yeah, I think we made a good, good attempt. Thanks for sticking around. I have no idea how long this total video is going to be. I have a feeling it's going to be way longer than I intended. But I know there's a lot of people out there that always message me and they're like, I just want to see more videos painting. And, you know, I think that's something that's really actually missing out in a lot of art schools as well. So with my students here, I also always strive to paint in front of them and do tutorials in front of them instead of just telling them how to do things. I think that's really important in teaching. So as you paint, look at other people painting and make up your own techniques or copy those of the masters. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. If you want to write in the comments down below who I should do the painting like for next video, let me know in a comment down below and I'll try to accommodate those as time goes on. All right, thanks a lot. So I've decided that since Picasso didn't do these in one day, if you look closely at a lot of the paintings, you'll see that there is a lot of scumbling, which means the paint would be dry, and then he'd kind of drag uh, dry paint, you know, not oily, very oily paint, on top of that dry paint. So I'm going to hit it with some of this Krylon Quick Dry, and you can just spray this on your painting and it should dry in about 24 hours and then I'll be able to jump into it tomorrow because I think it it deserves a little bit more than this layer. Everything kind of seems the same wetness and, and that's not how Picasso's paintings work. So I'm just going to hit this. Pretty simple. Still just using a medium of drying linseed oil. That's it. And in reading more about cubism, you find out that I'm probably using far too much color. And these were more monochromatic studies of form. So I have to continually go back to my reference still life and really let things bubble up from that reference. You don't want to forget about what we see since cubism is a study of the world around us, basically. Getting all my colors made up again. So day two, and it did dry. It dripped a little bit in a couple areas, but whatever, I'll be able to paint over that. In looking at this and looking at my source imagery, I feel like this is really flat, and a lot of this sort of thing needs to be happening more, where there's definite shape coming out, and these lines are, are just too thick. Often Picasso would blend these lines off into gradients. So today I'm just going to work on making a lot of different gradients in these shapes and trying to get rid of this blockiness, make it have more depth. It's a little bit flat right now. So we'll jump into that right now. Cubes, basic shapes.
think the more we can think about each one of these little shapes within this composition, like this triangle thing here, start thinking of each of these as occupying their own space instead of just being flat elements on a canvas. They should also hold some type of shape. This is from the, pardon my pronunciation, I thought it would be cool to read some different writings that were happening during the time of Cubism and we could listen to them while you watch me attempt this Cubist painting. So these would be from journals and those types of things. This particular one is written by Guillaume Apollinaire in 1912. And it's called, Young Painters Do Not Come to Blows. A few young people, art writers, painters, and poets, are gathering to defend their plastic ideal, which is the ideal itself. The title they have given their publication, La Section d'Or, The Golden Section, indicates well enough that they do not believe themselves isolated in art, and that they are linked to the great tradition. It happens that the tradition in question is not that of most popular art writers of our time. Too bad for these art writers. A few of them, to give gravity to their flightiness, have not hesitated to demand that their opinions carry penal sections against the artists whose works they do not like. Passion is blinding these poor people. Let us forgive them, for they know not what they are saying. It is in the name of nature that they are attempting to crush the new painters. We wonder what nature can have in common with the products of degenerate art defended by the citadel of Rue Bonaparte or with the paintings of the wretched heirs of the Impressionist masters? It is much more likely that the severe investigations of the young masters who, with admirable courage, have accepted the burlesque name people use to ridicule them, will lead back to the study of nature. The Cubists, whichever current they belong to, appear to everyone concerned about the future of art to be the most serious and the most entering interesting artists of our time. And to those who would like to deny such an obvious truth, we reply that if these painters do not have any talent, if their art is unworthy of being admired, those who make it their profession to guide the public's taste have no reason to concern themselves with it. Why so much anger, distinguished censors? The cubists don't interest you? They don't take any interest in them. But look at the shouting, the gnashing of teeth, the appeals to the government. When so much venom enters the hearts of art critics, such violence, such lamentations prove the vitality of the new style of painting, and the works it produces will earn admiration for centuries to come. Whereas the poor detractors of contemporary French art will soon be forgotten. It must not be forgotten that they took shots at Victor Hugo, his glory was not diminished. On the contrary, Guillaume Apollinaire. This is Pierre Reverdi, and he also has an article about the section door exhibition. The chief characteristic of the Section Door exhibition may be that it entails the first complete grouping of all the artists who ushered in the 20th century, with works clearly representative of the tastes, trends, and ideas that characterize it overall. Until 1910, Pablo Picasso, Metzinger, and Braque were the only pioneers of the movement. 
in various ways, which we will study moreover. And it was they who originated the term cubism. Since then, however, a growing number of artists have followed them and have made significant contributions to the search for truth, have displayed great courage in the face of critics' inevitable attacks, and have just caused a complete panic among the judges. These judges readily call the outdated views of their ancestors drivel, even though, essentially, the poor think, the poor things think just like them. In any case, the number of artists was so great and so valorous that it now seems very difficult to place all those represented under a single label. The difference between Metzinger and Picasso is as clear as that which separates Renoir from Cezanne, to whom they are comparable. By the way, in their temperaments and in certain gifts, in addition, there is such a difference between men, such as Leger and Duchamp, between Pacabia and Fresne, and between Glisse and Gris. That, just as it is no longer occurs to anyone to call Cezanne and Renoir impressionists, the term cubists is losing meaning day by day, assuming it ever had a well-defined one. There were ten of them a year ago. There are fifty this year. A champagne broker declared the other day in a major daily. In his classic sample case, he lines up venerable wine bottles that are much more commendable than he, of course, all the while composing little diatribes against every art venture that he thought, or at least he was told, was resolutely free from any filthy commercial idea. Well, for once, that fellow was right. So much so that the development this art movement has undergone for some time has been so great that its proponents felt they ought to combine their efforts in this exhibition. Despite brokers of any camp whatsoever, people who love the new provided it looks like the old, and the very people La Rochefacold spoke of, who, though fools endowed with some wit, nonetheless have no reasonable judgment. The exhibition, furthermore, seems complete to me because it offers a set of infinitely varied temperaments. There are realists and sensualists, idealists and intellectuals, impulsives and ponderers, sages who, following the directive of the Greek philosopher, quote, combine an ounce of madness with their wisdom, and also madmen who temper their madness with some wisdom. In a word, there is a rich flowering of diverse personalities such as can be seen in any artistic period of some value. I will not mention here the principles of the only painting worthy of that name, which these brilliant, brilliant minds have codified. What idea could be more beautiful than that conception of a pure painting which as a result, is neither descriptive nor anecdotal, nor psychological nor moral, nor sentimental nor pedagogical, nor, finally, decorative. I am not saying that such ways of understanding painting are to be overlooked, but there is no disputing that they are in irremediably inferior. Painting must be exclusively an art derived from the study of forms with a disinterested aim that is, with none of the aims I have just cited. What more noble loftiness of thought could there be? What more frank refusal to please the ignorant gawkers at these big painting fairs held annually in covered markets or sinister avenues, well ex whether ex Alexander III or Antin? What is there to say of that rich flowering of new ideas? still very solidly founded on the best and the purest precepts of the ancients, on their love of learning, which is a criterion for our ever so refined modern sensibility, on that tendency to weigh and measure everything properly, to leave nothing too vague and ever so ridiculous inspiration, on that absolute desire to make a painting otherwise than by holding the little nude model in one hand and by thinking on the other hand how will you sell the painting which, 
all in all, must not be so easy as that. What is there to say, finally, about these noble efforts, except to note the enthusiasm they inspire? Who would not be surprised by that marvelous idea borrowed from the primitives, which the hackneyed artists of the Renaissance had forgotten? The idea of painting, of conception, in place of a painting of vision? Only someone who has loved but meagerly by the gods and cherished but slightly by his mother could fail to glimpse the brilliant results that may be occasioned by that principle. Curious and pure, of painting things as one conceives them and not as the myopic broker and whatever it might be introduced above believes he sees them. How can we not praise that categorical rejection of such antiquated childness of horizontal composition, respect for perspective, trompe foreshortening, and other little tricks worthy of some Lepine competition or a theater in La Châtelet. And above all, that unvarying love of dogged research. One senses that the painters of these canvases, almost never satisfied with themselves and unhappy with their works as soon as they're done, do not wait to finish one painting before addressing new problems and let go of a resolved issue only to turn to the elucidation of a new one. For them, any new thing immediately becomes an opportunity to know, to discuss, to draw profitable lessons, with the aim of refining their sensibility even further. Of course, they are not among those who think that no art is possible in our time. On the contrary, they live intimately with it and, as it were, set up guard to protect it. Pouvi de Chavon who was brought to the famous Galerie des Machines one day, since he never would have set foot there on his own, exclaimed, Oh, my children, there is no more art to be done. How could a painter, a poet, fight with such social influence, such power over the imagination? Let's get out of here. What will become of, become of us artists in the face of that invasion of engineers and mechanics? A man who proposes such outrageousness is capable of anything, but fortunately, nobody reads him. By contrast, the modern artist must live with his era and know how to extract the beautiful, the curious, and the sensitive from everything that happens. To extract the pretexts for, for diversions of the mind and of the imagination. But obviously, the ignorant have no right to conduct similar investigations. It's quite enough already if they never think about them. For the most part, the artists whose work we have seen appear remarkably well educated. No branch of intellectual activity fails to interest them, and they are also hard workers, which means that the most difficult problems are very familiar to them. At this point, it is fitting to recall the masterful quality predominating in all of these works. Overall, the artists are gifted with a very keen intelligence. Nevertheless, I feel obliged to say that they may have misused it slightly, though that muse seems excusable. In point of fact, since nearly all of them are in a period of research, they have emphasized the intellectual element over the purely human. But that cannot be a reproach in this case, since as far as theories go, research is never too intensive and, in any case, the artists may humanize themselves only too quickly. We have just considered a few of their opinions. Let us now examine the works in particular. The broker in I Remember What Now, since he sells wine to Rodin, but whom I swear not to talk about this time, readily called the Cubists blind and hunchbacked and suggested that they do not know how to paint. But in our time, the man who may best know how to paint is a cubist. This is surely Metzinger. He displays a marvelous skill and knowledge, and had he only those qualities, he could be considered one of the best painters of our time. Yet he displays others as well. 
the nobility and delicacy of the portrait of woman he is exhibiting will be particularly appreciated. That portrait, severe and academic in its matter, is appealing for its finesse and especially for the self-assurance in its execution. The compelling charm it exudes attests to Metzinger's refined sensibility. No one will be surprised that the artist is being compared to Renoir and that he has the latter's grace, vivaciousness, and sev several of his best qualities. Picabia's work was viciously attacked recently, especially, of course, by those who do not believe they needed to make an effort to understand it. For many critics, it's shameful to ask the artist to explain his conception of art. That shows a paucity of human respect. How much better it is to appear lacking in insight than to risk foolishness you may later regret. Nozier expressed it very well recently. It is imprudent to say, while looking at a painting, it's foul or idiotic. Yes, alas, and how many people now regret treating the works of the great Mal Ma Malarme that way. It is nevertheless true that Picabia's conception is beautifully bold and vast in scope. I cannot expound on it in the limited space I have here, but I will do so at more length some other time. It is very obvious that one must get to know it, since it's excessively personal, but there is no denying that, even in considering his submission only superficially, his painting already seems to have a rare power and an extreme appeal. But, I repeat, it is still necessary to take great care in learning about it, and, given the rigorous personal pursuit, it is good not to judge it without due consideration. We have never understood Malarme at first reading, and those who make fun of Picabia's work would similarly mock Racine's Iphigenia if they had not already been taught what it was about. Alongside that very fiery portrait of a woman, which, and this is very rare, is both powerful and restrained, Leger exhibits several landscapes that are extremely worthy of interest. Leger, who once said, let's not forget the Impressionists, has wisely combined the precepts of these masters in modern imperatives. In these landscapes, it will be apparent that his slightly depraved charm of sensual vision has been tempered by the rigor of the school's principles. In addition, Leger seems to be one of the most deserving artists in the group, given that, endowed with a tumultuous imagination and a violent temperament, he is forced to restrain them as much as possible, counterbalancing them with precision and reason. Like Metzinger, he possesses a rare skill, and his art has a distinction that will be very appealing. Albert Glisé exhibits several canvases, the largest of which will attract special attention. For some time, Glisé has been making surprising progress. Very gifted from a pictorial perspective, he used to be somewhat careless. Today he has a great extent pulled himself together. His large painting demonstrates a very clear tendencies towards classicism. It may even be a bit museum, but the vigorous lines and rich color, as well as the originality of his ideas, mitigate the apparent coldness. In addition, this painting shows how wrong it is to claim that cubism does not please the eye, since, though it is not altogether pure painting, it is deliciously charming to look at. Gris has made an effort. He is certainly the most shakable purist in the group. To indicate, indicate clearly that the exclusive study of forms is his only preoccupation. He numbers his paintings rather than giving them titles. The painting that depicts a vanity table, equipped with its implement, will be an attention-getter. To make it clear that, in his view of pure painting, there are absolutely anti-pictorial objects. He has not hesitated to affix several real objects to the canvas. In fact, flat surfaces cannot be painted, since they are not bodies. <coughs> 
If we paint them, we fall back into imitation or per pursue the skills characteristic of sign painters. If I imagine a bottle and want to transpose it as it is, Cyril Berger, Chez Metzi, Paris Journal, 29th of May, 1911. At home with Metzi. Again this year, room 41 of the Salon de Zenbi Pendant, the Sanctuary of Cubism, is dispensing an incomparable emotion to its visitors. One work, above all, commands attention. On a frameless canvas stands an Eiffel Tower of an alarming beauty, cut up into irregularly re reassembled pieces. It is melting, buckling, coming to dizzy life, falling to pieces, shouting, between two piles of houses that encircle and clutch it tight to the point of suffocation. I felt I had before me the most complete manifestation of art in our modern times and, no doubt, in all times. An aspiring cubist, with whom I share all my confusion, told me, quote, If you want to understand completely, go see Metzi. He is both a great artist and the official theorist of the group. I went to see him at once. A school's raison d'etre, said the master, a very young man with limpid eyes, lies in the search for a standard of unprecedented beauty. What we need is to try to express reality by never before used signs. And the artist must not only create that standard of beauty, he must also impose it. Believe me, the day will come when the only women declared beautiful are those of a type that reminds people of a cubist ideal fashioned by us. And what is cubism? I asked, my voice choking on emotion. What is its essential significance? Our formula is to set aside all the accidental, complex forms and to retain only the fundamental and purely geometrical forms. That is why, to paint, we juxtapose cubes, squares, triangles, diamonds, parallelograms, trapezoids, pyramids, cylinders. Sir, I ventured timidly, your school has magnificently displayed its contempt for the major laws governing drawing. I cannot formalize them in any way, nevertheless. Do not be too surprised, he responded. To see in our works the contours of certain forms bristling with edges, which are the tips of cones or triangles, or to see entire members distorted by certain rotundities of surface, that, basically, is not of great importance. The need to create a rhythm subordinates the concern for pointless resemblances. Without doubt, one needn't exaggerate, even as one must not put three arms on a woman, even if that would emphasize her expression. There are situations where you have to know how to resist your own genius. I then steered the conversation to the canvas that had made such a strong impression on him. Yes, he told me, the Eiffel Tower by Robert Delaunay. Yes, it is a work of magnificent intuition. On that canvas, I observed, Nuvoni, Delaunay, so to speak, appended two enormous cubes of houses to the monument, and the houses are so tall they almost come up to the last platform. How do you explain that? It's very simple. In bringing the houses closer together, the painter has eliminated the awkward empty spaces. By adding height to them, he has suggested a softer more harmonious curve between the tops of the houses and the tower's summit, and then, in reality, dimensions, relationships, have only a relative value. Since, given the infinite divisibility of the line, 
No one can prove the absolute equality of two lengths. No one can sustain that the houses next to the Eiffel Tower are not, not as tall as it is. What about the distortion inflected on the monument? That's an old prejudice you have to shed. Objects are not immutable. Everything moves, everything in nature is crawling with life. The Eiffel Tower like everything else. Run around it and you'll see that it runs. So to want to represent it motionless and all in one piece, as on postcards, is quite nonsensical. In truth, what did Delaunay do? He cut it into four parts, after which he has reassembled the pieces, being very careful not to juxtapose them and to leave large gaps between them. He could have even intervened and put the summit at the base and the pillars at the top. In that way, he might have produced a disconcerting monument. Disconcerting, but sublime. Our major preoccupation, you understand, is to arrive at a total image that is the subjective representation of the object. Take a portrait. If it is from the front that the character of the figure is most apparent, but there is in the structure of the nose, for example, an important characteristic element that can be seen only in profile, the painter has the right to place his nose in profile on the figure viewed frontally. Now, to accentuate that little infraction of the rules of anatomy, he has only to paint the nose black or red. In that way, he replaces the anatomical equilibrium he destroyed with the plastic equilibrium of a new kind. Admirable, I exclaimed. Until now, he continued, we have been condemned to paint only empty things, corners of studios, little bits of landscapes, what I would like is to tackle great official paintings. I dream of capturing through our procedures grand ceremonies, unveilings with the President of the Republic, assemblies, the Tsar in the middle of the court, or then again, military reviews, battle squadrons. It is to us that this returns by right. Because, you see, the art of the official salons is the vastest, the most monstrous hoax the crudest farce that has ever been committed. He gave me a deep, penetrating look and added, on the whole, all these people are madmen. Then he resumed in a more ardent voice. We cubists have only done our duty by creating a new rhythm for the benefit of humanity. Others will come after us who will do the same. What will they find? That is the tremendous secret of the future. Who knows if someday, a great painter, looking with scorn on the often brutal game of the supposed colorists and taking the seven colors back to the primordial white unity that encompasses them all, will not exhibit completely white canvases with nothing, absolutely nothing on them. I retreated at that point, distraught. Cyril Berger, May 1911. Roger Allard The Quest on Several Painters, June 1911 For any curious and impartial observer, there can be no doubt that painting, of all the arts, currently occupies the most advanced point on the ideal evolutionary curve. In fact, if one concedes that the loftiest assertions of the plastic arts were built within logic and consciousness, and can, how can one fail to do so, one thing is clear. The masters, authentic inventors of canons, ephemeral but age-old in their genius, have almost everywhere outpaced the meditations of philosophers and the words of poets, thanks to the prestige of a few colored strokes. Without pointless scholarly retrospection, let us take in the 17th century French garden at a glance, next to Racine's noble and pure portico, Berenice, stands Triomphe de Flore, the Triumph of the Flora. 
On the one hand, the endpoint, the synthesis, the maximum tension of an adult art. On the other, the same irreproachable maturity, a no less perfect objectivity, but swelling with the possibility of flight. Some forms of beauty tolerate the ornaments of a charm born of fashion. In the vicinity of their accessible perfection, they excite the taste, intelligence, and secondary gifts that nature has always lavished on pastichures. A few of them, but oh, so few, look so unlike our lives, make gestures so different from those we believe to be alive, that we are likely to look upon them as dead beauties. But they are false ruins, and as soon as the procession of skillful imitators have vanished, the architect of genius comes along and continues the still unfinished arch, like that of a sublime bridge connecting one age to the next. Next to that exemplary lesson, what is the worth of the puerile sophisms that the exploiters of fashion raise as objections to every re renaissance? And yet, have not these exploiters, with the naive complicity of a nation of sheep-like art lovers, attempted to cover our over the tracks and to create such a confusion that it has become almost impossible to find, in the current chaos, the directions of painting? This study, in fact, is dedicated to a determination of them. I have chose to make it schematic. It may be incomplete. Upon reflection, my excuse lies in the difficulty of synthesizing sometimes contradictory movements. Some may be astonished, others will feign astonishment in the presence of the names they read here. I do not even dare hope that everyone will grant me the benefit of the doubt. But the impartial reader of these preliminaries will no doubt perceive, and this is the essential thing, the spirit of objective determinism that presides over the critical essays that follow. At the 1910 Salon d'Automne, a landscape by Le Fauconnier, Le Fauconnier, Le Fauconnier, Le Fauconnier, Le Fauconnier, another by Albert Glisé, and a third by Metzinger, expressed in diverse ways a common postulation of an artistic renaissance, a notion surely inaccessible to the tendencies of the contemporary painters who are called avant-garde in a childishly bellicose metaphor. The influence of Cézanne on these artists, and on others to be discussed later, is manifest. But once this observation has been made, it is important to prevent any ambiguity. Cézanne rediscovered a certain number of pictorial truths, or rather, a single truth with multiple aspects. Amid the sickly exhaustion of secondary formulas, he stood tall like a tree coming back to life, renewed by the true tradi tradition to which we are indebted for Poussin, Lorraine, Ang, and Corot. But painters attentive in it, but painters attentive to the suggestions of a vulgar or predified sensualism have perceived in him only an original collection of minor variants, which they have assimilated and used with equal unawareness. It would be an easy trick to illustrate the assertion with many examples, but pointless for the present study. The artists to whom this study is dedicated have been able, contrary to so many others, and because they were seeking only a subjective benefit, to find in Cezanne's work a lesson and an encouragement. In terms of influence, I would not be doing an injustice if I omitted Pablo Picasso and Braque. The violent personality of the former lies resolutely outside the French tradition, and the painters with whom I am concerned have felt that instinctively. In addition, some sort of composite malarmism could not deceive for very long, and pursuits in that direction are limited by the most narrow horizon. 
It was all the more important in this case to make a note of my feeling at once, since I believe I can discern the importance of an auspicious inversion of aesthetic values somewhere else. The advent of a new canon is therefore an eventuality that is fitting to envision with the most sympathetic attention. The belated defenders of individualism will be greatly shocked, necessarily so, to see a strong group forming under the auspices of an attraction to the same ideal, react violently against the instantaneous notation, the insidious anecdote, and all the substitutes for Impressionism. In that regard, do not be satisfied with skillfully varying modish appearances, but reappraise the arsenal of painting and exclude form it the bric-a-brac of false literature and pseudo-classicism. The ambition of these artists is to express themselves with the painter's means. Between their sensibility and that of the beholders, they claim to tolerate only plastic intermediaries. Courageously, they wish to destroy the rigged screens indispensable to all practitioners of the most limited skill. There is no concern to be soothing to the eye, to finesse the transition between the logical aspect of a balance of colors or that of an equivalent set of measures, and the incurable inertial of the retinas equipped with immutable stencil plates. Hence, the cosmic incident, reduced to its legitimate importance, stripped of the excess weight of tinsel imposed by seductive fashion, by that very fact regains its primordial value. One should not conclude from that harsh tactic that this is an oppressive discipline of one's essential instinct. On the contrary, the artistic gift is all the more indispensable to the artist in that he does not allow himself the auxiliary procedures that some people have abused to such advantage. Le Fauconnier, whether he is constructing the image of a rocky Brittany or arranging the postures of his noble and familiar heroines, subordinates everything to composition. Hence grandeur is the dominant characteristic of his art. Sometimes, too conscious of his mastery, he does not even refrain sufficiently from an inclination to communicate a premature museum look to his canvas. But one must pay tribute to the desire for construction that governs each of his pictures. When one looks at them, one never has the impression of embellishment and ornamental veneer. On the contrary, every detail or form or color turns out to have come into being via a fully intelligent genesis. The Portrait of the Poet, which can be seen at the Salon des Indépendants, marks the stages of a productive journey of conquest, whose end is not in sight. Since I have decided not to resign myself to a form of descriptive criticism whose vanity is abundantly and daily demonstrated, I will note in all the artists concerning the most salient traits, and moreover I invite the hurried reader, perchance worried about theoretical generalities, to read the beginning of this study. In a commendable spirit of reflection, Albert Glisé continues his evolution. As he emerged from the Impressionist crisis, full of aversion for the verbalism of color, he wanted, with exceptional awareness, to impose himself a true cure. If I may say so, of sincere and accurate simplicity, he was able to understand that, in accelerating the development of his personality, in rushing forward, he had nothing to gain but pernicious flattery. Hence, he devotes the greatest attention to form. His most recent landscapes and the very beautiful study of a nude reproduced here are evidence of that. In the latter canvas, I perceive intentions far removed from the preparation of an academic study or a rapid neo-impressionist sketch. The effort at composition manifests itself not through an organization of gestures, but through concerted alterations in which all elements of the spectacle participate. How can one fail to admire the efforts of an artist in perpetual struggle against the very abundance of his gifts, 
and whose goal is to discipline them to the point of leaving nothing of the decorative impulses that once made me hesitate to embrace him. In addition, I cannot make up my mind to ignore the criticisms directed at Albert Glisé regarding the compositions with which he illustrated a recently published book of poetry. Some people wanted to see these drawings as a commentary on the text, and they questioned whether there was a perfect accordance between the character of the drawings and that of the poems. One thing mattered, however, to create a balance on every page and throughout the book between lines of print and concerted arabesques, it did not seem to me that the artist fell short of that essential task. The very beautiful images with which he decorated Mr. Mer Mercero's next book confirmed me in that feeling. Delaunay appears very different. Gifted with a phenomenally keen eye, he instantly resituates the materials of his decorative constructions within the ambience of the prism. In my view, it is there, rather than in risky pursuits, that his true original originality lies. The disassociation of the objects constituting an aspect to the point of producing a mobile interpretation among them brings to mind, in particular, a certain futurist manifesto that provoked a great deal of laughter. I don't really know why. At bottom, it was only an adaptation of the Impressionist's method, applied to larger surfaces and volumes, but which would culminate in disintegration and chaos, not order and harmony. When Delaunay fragments and dismembers the Eiffel Tower, to give su substance to the plastic so forces diverging around it, I think he is making too explicit what ought to be an indirect suggestion. Also, inevitably, the result of that emphasis will be to make us rapidly blasé and to raise the possibility of a d dangerous banality. But Delaunay is the master of color. He knows the art of capturing light suspended in the atmosphere divided in four by a central axis, in general, in that artist's pictures, centrifugal currents dominate. <coughs> Those of Le Fauconnier, in contrast, are more deliberately focused and always seem animated by converging wills. One would not want such artists to have the naivete of Henry Rousseau, and yet, the painter's memory is oddly evoked by certain of Ferdinand Leger's intentions. Leger will be criticized for the monstrosity of the figures he creates. As for me, I sense how painful this transitional stage in his evolution is to the painter himself. The need for it is not in doubt. An om nudes in a forest bears witness to considerable and probably fertile effort. One cannot deny the exactitude or the audacity of the measurements, and, in certain portions, the perfect organization of the horizontal planes. There is an innate sense of composition in it. What excites Leger is less the architecture of inert volumes than the intermittent and multivalent life of human or cosmic gestures. It seems that he is intent on measuring the most insignificant trajectories in analyzing their most extensive torsion, whereas Delaunay frequently displaces the beholder's point of view and sometimes puts it at the center of the plastically represented event. A futurist and, in my view, very risky composition, Leger is fond of dragging along an entire entourage of atmospheres, accessories, in compliments, intentionally confused, in fact, in the neutrality of a rather unpleasant and, I am convinced, transitory color, as he displaces a volume. Last year, Metzinger caused an excessive degree of alarm. In carefully considering the canvas of his that caused the scandal, I found that the most daring possibilities were only barely indicated, and that one ought to be grateful to this poet for a certain reserve in applying Malamism to painting. 
In any case, the poetic and hence instructive feature of his art has since become sharper. I confess I am very sensitive to the precious charm that surrounds his two figures of nude women. This canvas exudes a real intimacy, thanks to the integration of the setting into the principal volumes, and not through the facile flittering or reshuffling of arbitrary strokes, common in Vuillard, for example. I was less appreciative of his landscapes, where composite elements are introduced here and there. The tones are, in fact, very appealing, and exempt from all extremist grandiloquence. But it is very clear to me that this study is above all a quest for possibilities, which leads me to a natural conclusion. All the tendencies I have just indicated all too briefly attest, in short, to a unanimous desire to paint pictures by which one must understand composed, constructed, organized work and not notations and rapid sketches where the ruse of false spontaneity masks a fundamental void. The sterility of any effort in the direction of Impressionism need no longer be demonstrated. There would be more danger in certain little formulas based on tiny retrospective discoveries and destined to create an illusion where were they not shortly to become outdated. That is the inevitable fate of works of art produced under the influence of fashion or superficial literary excitation. It would be pointless to conceal how dangerous that return of great painting appears to the commercial interest groups currently setting the standards. Should these tendencies come to prevail, the rest will be the collapse of minuscule and fragmentary art, and the total rout of those who scandalously profit from its sham popularity. Anyone who wishes to see the end of the period of anarchy and confusion that painting has just gone through must encourage these truly liberating efforts and delight in the spectacle of them. Roger Allard, June 1911. So I could continue on working on these gradients and these sort of things, but in the end, I really started seeing a lot of this interplay simply between warm and cool, this type of orange and this type of bluish gray, and not being afraid to poke some really deep holes into that area. I think it's really a question of, you know, this type of a line here, in this type of a line here. And sometimes in these Cubist paintings, they really do uh, go pretty dark. So thanks for watching. I know this is quite a long video, but I enjoy making them and I hope you enjoy watching them. I'm currently redoing the beginning painting course over at paintingcourse.com. So if you get a chance, go check that out. And Hopefully the new course should be done in about a month, and I'll have all of that ready, so there'll be a brand new course for people to go through for painting. Share and like, subscribe if you like this type of video, write a comment down below on which artist I should do next. Thanks for watching.